So this presentation is developing an effective EA repository with great amounts of data comes great responsibility and how to transform your repository into that single source of truth to make informed decisions. So the agenda on this presentation is um, showing you how, um, how we created a roadmap and onboarding of the EA repository, how to build an effective meta model um, for uh, business application data and technology um, architectural streams. Uh, what are the sources of truth of the data um, and what does the integration process look like? How to produce the content to provide those beneficial insights um, and make them engage in? And how does that take up look like? How to mature the EA capability through the use of the repository? And finally, I will um, take any questions and uh, hope to answer them. So a little bit about me. Um, Charlie mentioned I'm a senior enterprise architect in NSTAR and I've, I've worked with NSTAR for nearly two years now. Um, have a, a background about over four and a half years in enterprise architecture, but I have an overall uh, 20 years experience in IT and consultancy, um, developing uh, systems and products uh, and architecting solutions. Uh, I worked in many different um, in, uh, sectors, uh, predominantly insurance, um, also finance, manufacturing, energy, motoring, retail and entertainment. Um, just a disclaimer, all opinions expressed or implied in this presentation are those of, of myself. They don't necessarily reflect the views of NSAR or Avolution. And my LinkedIn address is, is below. So a little bit about NSTAR. So it was founded in 1993. Um, it has a global footprint of um, over 30 offices, uh, headquarters in B Bermuda, but many offices in the US, EU and Australia. It has over a thousand employees and has uh, made a hundred acquisitions since its formation. So NSTAR is a insurance runoff consolidator uh, for non-life runoff insurance. And this would be uh, employees liability, workers comp, marine, transport, aviation, and construction. And it became the largest runoff consolidator in 2013 and offers expertise in risk analysis and investment. So it manages insurance and reinsurance com companies and portfolios. Um, and Here's sort of a diagram, an example to, to show um, what that process looks like. Um, when we, when NSTAR makes an acquisition, it looks at um, the sellers who wish to sell their um, uh, books of business for, for, for a premium. So it enters an agreement with the seller to cover the future claims for that premium. And that could be through a number of um, sell options, either through share purchase, portfolio transfer, or a reinsurance arrangement. So the seller benefits from this, from the release of its capital and the administration effort. NSTAR then uh, invests in that premium, it gains from the sale, and then manages and handles those claims. The profit it returns to the shareholders is the return of investment plus any claim savings. NSTAR also offers opportunities for commutation, which is offsetting the credits and debts as we've acquired multiple uh, books of business or portfolios over the years, that that's that's the that means that uh, it increases or maximizes the profit to the shareholders. So, because of the um, ever-changing landscape of NSTAR with its acquisitions and divestments, the landscape uh, does change considerably and provides those. Um, um, it provides a challenge for, 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 uh, for, for ourselves. So across the, the world, in the EU, US, and the, re and the rest of the world, NSTAR is actually comprised of a number of holding companies. Within those holding companies, there's a number of limited insurance and reinsurance companies. And within those insurance companies, there's a number of books of business that are managed by those limited companies. And with this complex uh, business, there's a systems landscape um, beneath it all that has a number of uh, systems, shared services across claims, reinsurance, finance systems, data warehouses, data marts um, that provide the data ultimately to the reporting platforms. So it always becomes a constant challenge to try to understand uh, the future 
with the future acquisitions or future divestments, what the system landscape could look like or should look like. And there's more um, common uh, challenges that I'm sure many of you will be <laughs> aware of that there's a number of repositories for documentation. They can exist in uh, MS Teams, SharePoint document libraries or existing EA repositories, which we, which we have, or they could just sit on someone's local drive or email or even people's heads. And those and, and the type of diagrams that are often beneficial for change can be spread in many of these different areas. And they're often of good quality at that point of time, but over years, they become locked in people's heads or, or the, 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 the discovery process becomes challenging. So when there are new business opportunities or, um, or through acquisitions, or if there's drivers to improve the business efficiencies, such as finance process improvements or claims handling, or there's, um, it's, uh, there's new re re regulations in, in a certain um, jurisdiction, um, then this offers um, uh, a challenge when it comes to change and the discovery and analysis of this documentation um, can take weeks. And this is what we see the, the EA repository um, to help reduce that time considerably. So what was our journey? Um, how do we onboard from the initial um, um, procurement of ab Abacus? Well, once we went through the initial selection pr uh, procedure, and we started to um, uh, configure and set this up. We had initial training with our core architecture team and some initial kickoff sessions. And through this initial setup, we then created a, um, a first draft of the meta model. And this was just to understand how to configure it, uh, set up some basic users and groups and in ways of working. Um, and then we started work on the initial content. And after about eight weeks, um, we started to create some true content. So we had a, a meta model that was able to, to be utilized for some solution diagrams we were um, creating for existing projects. Uh, we um, had a integration set up with this, our configuration management to, to database and service now. And we started to create a dashboard showing the technical debt matrix. And then we started to publish uh, this information to a wider audience within the enterprise. Um, started to create our capability models, um, looking from a level one down to level three and even level four. Um, creating more dashboards ready for publishing and some high level enterprise uh, architecture views. Then as we started to increase the uh, amount of content over a sort of four month period, we started to onboard some of the existing um, uh, work that we had done prior to adopting the, the tool, such as the application roadmap, uh, three-year plan. And we started creating some traditional architecture diagrams. We increased the meta model um, and the constraints between them and created more viewpoints. And, and now from six months onwards, we're, 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 we're embedding the process into core solution architecture work. Um, we've got dashboards that are used for a wider consumption and we had the demos to um, the IT audience at large and to other stakeholders outside in, in, um, in the business. And I was starting to look at what does the governance and change process and control look like to content authors and looking to begin this adoption outside of the architecture community. So the first thing we wanted to do was to look at the, mod, uh, the meta model and the approach to that was to look at a model that would fulfill all potential use cases, create a base meta model that can be expanded as the content evolves, but utilize the best of breed of existing languages. We didn't want to reinvent the wheel completely. And we wanted to limit the number of allowed connections. Uh, I believe in when we, to create content, there's no right answer to create the diagrams, but a simplified model can really help to provide that consistency so we looked at Archimate as the, as the boilerplate, if you like, um, for creating the meta model. But we took lots of elements from BizBoc um, for the business architecture um, viewpoints. And we also used um, some components of the BPMN notation as well. So we could um, provide better business process to diagrams that are um, uh, understood by the business analysts. 
So this then creates our own NSTAR meta model. That is, um, you know, it, it's got some specific ele elements to, to NSTAR, but, but can be used, I think, in across of other, other industry areas as well. The meta model design uh, looks like this. We have a, quite a, a rich number of component types now uh, in, in our repository. We have, uh, and they're all um, composed into um, various groups. So we have motivational component types, people, strategy, project, business, application, the data and infrastructure. And these component types are used across a number of viewpoints. So we have, uh, we started creating the solution architecture viewpoint as our first one, uh, and then created a business architecture one. And we, we created a business but the benefit uh, viewpoint as well, which would be uh, of use to think with portfolio managers um, in the future. And then we created the BPM diagram and we have a, a graph viewpoint as well, which is um, useful for the enterprise dashboards. The ones that we're looking to do in the future is a sort of a cloud specific technology viewpoint, and one that's specific to um, uh, projects and programs in, in looking at um, showing how change affects the system landscapes. So this is our solution architecture viewpoint. And you can see here that the application component type is sort of central to, to, to this viewpoint. And within here, we have the concept of an application that is um, composed of application modules um, with other logical components that aren't native to Archimate, such as the logical with the database and the logical with the document store. Uh, we wanted to show how relational databases or document repositories look within these kind of views. Um, these are then linked to um, physical counterparts. So we have the um, physical database or database instance, then that relates to a logical database. So we're able to show environment uh, specific uh, views as well with this one single viewpoint. Uh, we also have the, the data objects as well. So we have the concept of a the data set, which can can uh, correspond to either a, a database schema in a relational database or a, record, or a report schema in uh, Power BI or Cognos or some other BI tool. And then the data objects correspond to, uh, let's say, a data table. And then you, you can then identify individual uh, data writer elements within here as well. For the business architecture viewpoint, um, this is um, capability organization and value streams are central to this, to, to this viewpoint. Uh, we wanted to show uh, capabilities and how they realize the value stream and the value stream stages are components within value stream stages components within the value streams um, and a couple of motivational view, uh, component types as well on how those value streams serve either external or internal stakeholders the organizations are composed of business units um, that realize business functions of which the business processes then serve those business functions and they also relate to the value streams we have um, some specific component types here where we've got portfolio and class of business where we wanted to show which organizations own which portfolios and which portfolios then manages or has specific classes of business. And then they're then also linked to applications um, and then applications, which applications support which classes of business. And then a technology viewpoint. At the moment, we, we, we've got one that's um, utilizing graph dots, which is a great visualization in, in uh, Abacus, um, where we can see uh, from a particular starting node, such as a server, what relationships um, are associated to those um, to that starting node. So a server might um, be hosted on a particular location, um, hosted in, in it within, within a data center or in the cloud. Um, we'll have a number of infrastructure services. Those application modules then will be linked to uh, an application. And those applications can be aggregated up to an e ecosystem. Um, one thing I forgot to mention on the other slide is that we use the ecosystem as a term to um, group up a more granular level of applications. So that is easier to communicate and convey um, certain um, decisions um, when these high-level groupings uh, are used. 
we have a benefit realization viewpoint where um, um, where in order to justify the project or to initiate a project, we, we, we have um, these mandates or charters. And there's always a benefits case to determine, um, is it worth doing? Is it worth doing this project? Um, and one of the, I think the flexible things of Abacus is to be able to create viewpoints like this, where we can actually quantify what the benefits are and to show that in, in a diagram. So that's key, key to, to decision stakeholders can actually use this and they can see and measure um, what those um, 2B capability models should, would look like with the solution changes and how the projects and the deliverables on those projects then realize those changes in the capabilities. And then we can show how these then are aligned to any strategic objectives and then link to the ultimate mission and vision of um, which drives those objectives. Our BPMN viewpoint, the goal here was to um, use the existing component types in the meta model as much as we could. So that's when we talk about a business process, either in an Archimate focus diagram or a BPMN diagram here, they are the same thing. And, and that was easy to do. What we're able to um, show here is that the activities that you see here are actually just um, business processes. And the events, um, the triggers are uh, business events. And we used um, super types and, and, and derived uh, types to um, show which are message events, for example, or start and end events. And those then can be linked to the value streams here. So that's whether you're, um, we've created a process flow diagram at this level, where it's, you can see the, the swim lanes are associated with either business units or roles. Those same, this same um, content and it can be used in an Archimate style diagram. We could look different, but mean exactly the same thing. Um, we also wanted to extend this particular view to show value stream as well, because that means that we can show where the relationship between processes, business processes, to value streams, to capabilities. Um, and that triangle then um, helps, helps drive these conversations that we need, um, that these are useful for. So how do we, um, what is our integration strategy look like into the EA repository? So as we were growing the content um, in the EA repository, we, have a num we had a number of existing sources. So one of the goals was to um, adopt uh, Ab Abacus, was to try to consolidate this, try to create these single views so that um, IT, multiple um, IT teams or um, other business teams didn't have their own source of data, they could, they could use a trusted source of data. But there's challenges to that. As you can see here, there's uh, in Abacus that you see in the center, the, there are a number of existing um, the data sources and repositories um, that have its own source of data. And some of these are um, good and accurate and can be used. Um, and some of them would probably would benefit from being synchronized from another data source. So we have existing, for example, we have existing like spreadsheets, um, vendor spreadsheets, that was very manually maintained. Um, not shown on here, but we, we are adopting a, um, uh, a management software, for vend, for vend, uh, <clears throat> sorry, a vendor related um, vendor management software package that we're just introducing now. So that will help, um, you know, consolidate and make um, and make that more of a trusted source. But with all of these data sources, we have uh, trying to describe here in this diagram is the notion of a source of record, an ultimate source of record. What is a trusted source? What's a copy of the data that's local um, and useful for that particular function that, that software is used for? And this was a very useful diagram um, when conveying this to various IT stakeholders and trying to describe the, the, the nature of the problem and how do we consolidate and improve the quality of the data across these different systems. Uh, as we are now um, adopting a cloud platform for all of our um, services uh, and applications, it now becomes a source of record for um, database, database instances, servers, 
um, application to some extent. And that, in, and that information then needs to be resynchronized to um, Abacus. We've determined the best way to do that in order to keep any cloud hosted systems and non cloud hosted systems is to, is to centralize that in our existing CMDB server. So this is where we will um, synchronize this via this service map uh, component that you, you might just be able to see on the, on the cloud platform area. And then we would synchronize that information into Abacus. So it becomes a trusted source. But other items that are very useful for us, such as the TCO of um, applications that won't be source and service now, we have to get that by some other means. And this is where um, we're looking to um, connect to the uh, Cloud Platform's API to pull that billing information in there so we can get good financial data that can be used at the server level and aggregated up to applications and then to capabilities. And in all of these um, component types to sort of raise the discussion about how do we improve and change this, um, we've, we've used sort of a, a color coding uh, attributes to show what's the data accuracy look like now, what does it should it be, and the, the, and the data completeness. And this has been good to communicate to say this is where we want to get to um, in order to make uh, people come to Abacus as a good trusted source. The CMDP process we adopted initially was to look at how the, day, the applications was mastered in, in a, one repository. Uh, because they've been created separately from um, how we would um, to document and uh, applications, because its primary purpose is to be used for support and to create and raise IT service tickets, they aren't, the, the applications need to be mapped slightly differently into, um, into what we would call applications. Now, I think this is a, a, a I think this is a reasonable thing to do. Is to, there's maybe always a, an element of transformation um, based on the use cases or the purpose of that source system. So we created a script that looked at a particular attribute. Here we've got application import mapping type, and decided is this um, should this be a application component that sits in a parent application? Um, should it be ignored completely because it's just a business service? Um, and one or two other attributes. And that way we have a, a good, clean, as is architecture that can still be traced back to its source information um, and then understood what mode of synchronization um, happens between it. And using the CMDB identifier, which is a GUID, to uniquely identify that component should we ever want to look back to that source system. Also in identifying where there are discrepancies where we should think they should be changed at source, this, is a, this was a great opportunity to be able to do that because we then had a list of, of applications and modules and to go and then go back to the CMDB owner to then challenge or to change what that, what that data should look like. So how did we look or approach the uh, repository maturity there was a number of use cases that were identified in the initial selection criteria. And I think there was a, there was a certainly a journey. We were on, we're definitely still all very much on that journey to look at maturing the, the, the areas and the use cases of uh, Abacus and where it could be used in within NSTAR. To start with, um, the architecture team um, has a number of consumers that we, we work on projects, solution architectures, uh, Institutional architects work on, the, on with the projects, and there's IT exec and there's other business execs, and we want to create um, solution architecture. We do platform reviews. Um, we were able to show technical debt, able to help in strategic decisions, uh, and help um, acquisitions. And the benefits here I wanted to, to show and to quantify what the benefits are in order to bring that data together. I think there's, with all of these, there's a journey from simple awareness to, to, to show to, uh, for example, execs and business execs, so this is all very nice, to actually adopting it and for them to want to come to us to actually get this, get this information. And I think this all comes back to the quality, trying to get the quality of the data in there to show that they can trust the, the, the architecture team and, and Abacus as a trusted source 
Um, so then their maturity then gets raised. So it becomes from maybe adopted to, uh, to an embedded process. And for business analysts, we're, we are doing that right now. So we're now extending the use of Abacus outside of the core architecture team. And business analysts are now starting to, to utilize it for um, as is analysis or, or on project analysis to look at the 2B. And the benefits of this is, is um, as sort of described, it, it can now dovetail exactly to our capability maps to understand what that scope, what, what does that project scope look like? Um, and it ultimately will reduce analysis time in future projects. The finance management, this is what we are um, starting to really want to um, go beyond from awareness to adoption now, is, is to take that information, take the financial information from uh, our cloud provider, um, and then we're able to um, map those TCOs from the service to the capabilities and business units. And this is then an opportunity um, for finance management to then look at and identify uh, future cost savings albeit from a, a purely environment um, server level, uh, looking at efficiencies across there or um, in terms of run costs or licensing costs or looking at whole, whole capabilities and how to optimize uh, the costs across the capability. And for data governance, um, this is something that we are um, on track now. We've, we have an existing um, uh, the data data lineage and um, data glossary application, and we have data stewards who now own um, own the data within NSTAR, and and this is now a great tool to um, take that information from that existing tool and to start to embed that within the EA repository to become a uh, single source of truth. And that then bridges the, the gaps between IT supported or the, the, the data between IT supported system and data that sits outside of those supported systems in Excel or some other um, or um, access databases or other files that, that, are, that are out there in the wild. So it's a good way to bring the two together so we can then have proper informed decisions about um, target states um, and driving future projects. One area we've not really looked at yet is the risk and compliance is, um, but I think it could be of, of benefit is to um, start to document um, cyber or disaster recovery risks and how those could be measured against technical debt and other um, components in, in the repository. And then maybe to look at holders and controls that can be used and recorded and measured against those IT services. So the approach to building out the content um, is like where, where's, where to start is always the, always the biggest, one of the biggest questions, I think. It's to, this diagram here, just to sort of illustrate a way to look at it, um, is to start thinking about, in order to answer some questions, um, how many component types do you need in order to answer that question? Um, here it's described as, as the breadth. The depth here is how much coverage do you need per component type? How many, how accurate and complete does the data need to be before it becomes useful and trusted? And obviously the, the wider it is and the deeper it is, the longer it, it takes to create that content. So when starting out, and I've got, I've got a number of examples here, uh, it, it's, it's easy and it's one of, one of the things that we did is to look at a conceptual target state architecture. You don't need many existing components to describe what that can look like. And again, this 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 is also this is already a useful um, diagram and, and tool uh, to convey. Um, and then we can start looking at um, as is models um, in a given domain. Uh, we use this for um, the financial transformation program and, and capabilities and value stream mappings. Um, that requires just a couple of uh, component types. But when you start to um, bring in the data from another data source that has a, a rich, complete set of data, such as CMDB, um, to provide information such as technical debt, then the depth of that coverage increases, and then you're able to do more things such as the, the, the data lineage between um, supported systems and non-supported systems, and ultimately things like capability 
and mapping that to the applications and mapping that to, to the servers. So these are things I've sort of listed to, to sort of watch out for. It's, it's, it's I think, as any um, repository starts to mature and, we, and there's more content being um, produced, there's also a lot more gotchas to make sure that it doesn't become another graveyard of information. So when content is not validated or it can't be trusted is, is one concern. It might just be created for a point of interest for one particular discussion point, but then it might become out of date very quickly or there's, there's no ownership of that content after it's been created. So people lose sight of what that purpose of the diagram was. Can, can, can we use it at all for anything else? Um, there could be multiple copies of similar diagrams um, within the same architecture. Or worse still, when emails, when there's been um, copies of, of the diagram that's been downloaded and emailed to senior stakeholders, and their, and their information, their basis of information is on that particular version, which might not be the final version or the version that is, is sourced and mastered in, 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 in the repository. It could be multiple sub-architectures. So people creating 2B uh, architectures or, or, or um, their own workspaces that aren't synchronized up and become out of date. And there could be, and when there are content authors outside of the core architecture team, which is something um, I think any maturity curve should, should, should do, is how to manage and curate that content that's been driven. Do they have different ideas of what, what, what the data types should be within, well, what the content should be within a particular code component type. So it's understanding what things can be done to, to, to harmonize the data, the, crowds, the crowdsourcing approach of, of the data coming from multiple different sources. So one of the things we've done, and, it, and I think it is early stages for us, is to, is to look at ways to improve that. So we, we put in a very light touch control framework within, uh, within our EA repository. Um, where we have a number of high-level categories um, that have um, associated diagrams and dashboards and to subjectively um, identify what their accuracy and completeness is and when it was last checked. So the idea of this is to, is to, is to provide a, a data source owner um, to make sure that they are responsible for these areas. We have regular sessions. We have a well, bi-weekly purely just housekeeping to go through um, the repository to identify um, which of these areas is out of date or which of these areas needs to be checked um, and, to, and, to, and to refresh those. Um, where there might be multiple sub-architectures that are redundant and can be deleted uh, or copies of diagrams that within the same architecture that could be um, removed as well. So we're trying to clean up as we go along. And so far that's been pretty good. I think we, we can do more around the, 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 the meta models, the, the controls and the audit control process. So we, we can go further where we maybe timestamp the individual diagrams and have them listed in, in another catalog like this um, to really identify where we think diagrams are not used or out of date. So things that we have done, and we can currently answer and show within um, within the tool. Oops. So we we can do the IT run. So we can we we, we have taken we haven't got real time synchronization, but we um, but from manual imports we are able to look at the IT run cost and aggregate that across servers and applications uh, capability. And we have some very good high level and detailed level solution diagrams and process flow diagrams in our finance systems and um, some detailed process flow diagrams in our seeded reinsurance systems. Um, we're able to share the application roadmap in terms of invest, tolerate and migrate. We've used it to do a very thorough and detailed major business transition, um, showing detailed uh, business architecture steps and what that transition looks like. Um, we can show the technical debt, so we can show uh, which operating, operating systems are running on which servers, and then can identify which applications those are related to, to help provide for IT forecast and budget for future years. We have a very good detailed uh, NSTAR capability model now, 
And we also have a detailed organization to portfolio uh, diagram and model. So the following slides is just looking at a few um, specific use cases that we've used uh, um, Abacus for. So initiative was set earlier this year to identify where we could um, implement solutions at low cost where there could be significant savings in an otherwise manually intensive process. Typically we were looking at um, projects that would only take two to four weeks. So current debt management capability within the CDRI space is, 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 is a problem um, that, we, that was identified, um, particularly around query analysis. And that's for the process uh, we have with re reinsurance with money zones or disputes. And we used Abacus to measure what that um, capability performance um, looked like. And then using the tool able to then create a target state architecture in this case, it was using Power Apps and Power BI to look at automation of this. And then we were able to implement uh, a solution in a very short space of time and then immediately show uh, where those systems uh, improvements were through that automation process. So able very, this was a very good and effective way to um, annotate the capabilities with effectiveness ratings so that we can look at um, short-term wins where we know there are deficiencies in some of the capabilities uh, within NSTAR. Another use case is cost analysis. Um, as we described, um, we have here from left to right the, the total server costs across a number of applications. And immediately there you can drill down into what those costs are, especially sort of in the top five and to see you know, is it environment specific? Is it licenses? Um, is it um, other factors that contribute to, to a high cost that we might want to um, uh, reduce? So we're able to do that very well within the tool just with our um, integration into, into CMDB. Um, we want to uh, take this further where we could look at BAU support costs and then measure um, put TCOs against headcount across IT support and business support as well. So that would help in future cases where we're looking at um, key strategic decisions in terms of the organization drivers, where they want to go next with, with certain parts of the business. And another good use case is the, the, the data lineage and business glossary piece. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have a, um, a power we have a report, we have Power BI that's produced, that produces um, glossary and lineage information. And that information is currently separate from Alpacus. And we want to now integrate that so we can have that combined view. And do it, but we don't need to change um, the reports. Those can still be used um, across other um, key users who find that particular view useful. So through the um, Abacus uh, API, we're still able to produce these types of reports where we can still show business glossary information and the data lineage information. And we can show here, the, for instance, we've got a decomposition tree where we've got the lineage from the ultimate source to the ultimate, um, or the ultimate child to the ultimate parent in terms of what, what does the data flow look like between all of the different steps. Um, and by using, uh, um, using the API through the data source um, querying, we were able to do that. In the case of the major transformation program, um, that took <coughs> the best part of a few years, is there were lots of projects that were happening concurrently around different instances of, uh, of some key um, systems that we were implementing across the EU and the US. There was no one single um, they all had different stakeholders. So it's very confusing to understand to um, businesses X exactly what does that solution landscape look like and what does the impact look like across um, all of the different regions. We were also, um, we decided to annotate the application component type to show where is a new development or where there was production changes, we were in, in production, but it was undergoing changes or it was live, but there was no um, changes at all. So this, this key insight was very useful to show um, to all um, 
project teams and 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 finance and CFOs to show what those interdependencies look like uh, for those applications and how they and how they were developed within the projects. Another use case was looking at um, the organizational mapping. Um, this helped um, companies' acquisitions or company divestment plans, where we wanted to show how the applications are serving which capabilities and which organizations, which you see on the x-axis here, um, are owned by or own which applications. So we can see this complex matrix has actually helps provide that key information when there are uh, company divestments or acquisitions and what does that system landscape change look like? So the application roadmap for us, um, so we've done quite a lot already in, in the, uh, I think it's one year now since, since, we, since we purchased uh, the tool. And we have um, more things planned um, in 2021 and beyond. Um, so for business architecture, we're looking at the, um, we want to do more performance metrics. We wanted to do a more subjective analysis on um, the capability maps, um, business unit to application map in and drill down to level twos and level three capabilities. Um, for solution architecture, that has now become an embedded process, um, but we want to um, onboard a lot of the existing work that we've done, such as the existing enterprise assessment diagrams and matrices that we've done manually in PowerPoint, for example, um, to continue the BPMM process diagrams to get more of the BA community using this so it becomes an, an embedded process as well. On the data architecture uh, stream, um, we have uh, our master reference data models in, in, in the system. And we're able to show what that source to target looked like across all the different um, applications. And now we're looking and planning to introduce and implement the data glossary and the, the, and the data lineage information in there as well. Um, for integration automation, um, so uh, as I mentioned, we want to integrate our uh, cloud service information, get the service map and cost monitoring into information into there as well. And to provide any um, outputs into, into BI, into Power BI, as we use as one of our reporting uh, tools. Um, so um, they could be shown in multiple ways to different audiences. And for metrics, so we wanted to bring in more vendor information, more real-time information from the new vendor management system. Um, and this is with a view that we could potentially ultimately replace our current BI, finance BI solution. Again, saving money and reducing complexity of, of these services. And for the adoption, uh, we, we say so we're using it um, extensively in project architecture. Um, we're starting to use it in, um, in, in, in discussions around business architecture and transition models. Um, we want to do more with um, acquisitions um, to provide more useful information for target state scenarios and to um, use it, embed the process in IT financial planning and key IT strategic planning and ultimately business planning.